Holocaust survivors in Europe. What do you see? Having to relive history. Is that a normal life? And then, a rare disease. The first thing I was asking is, am I gonna walk again? Has one mom staring at the end. If this is the way it is before you die, then Lord, take me. And a family hoping for a miracle. It was gonna be a long trip, I could sense it. On today's 700 Club. Well, if you want to get frightened this Thanksgiving, the State Department says don't travel. Be on the alert. The State Department has issued all uh, an alert for the entire world. And now we've got these groups. Let's see, who are they now? And you know all those groups, Terry? Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Boko Haram, yeah. and many others. And the State Department says every one of those radical groups could be planning deadly terrorist attacks soon in different parts of the world, I might add. And the government is warning Americans to be very careful, as I said. So uh, stay close to home, eat turkey, and enjoy it. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I would, you know, New York is going to load up with the Thanksgiving, Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. It would be an ideal target for the guys, to, uh, the and bad that seems guys. seems to me to, what they look for, that kind of. Soft target mm -hmm. where a lot of people gather and uh, well, yeah. okay, we'll, we'll see what happens. That warning comes as President Obama is facing serious questions about how he's handling the threat of terrorism. The public doesn't believe he has a plan for dealing with the killers from ISIS. Charlene Aaron has the story. As Americans make plans to travel for the holidays, the U.S. and European governments fear terrorists are making plans for more attacks. The State Department has issued an uncommon worldwide alert due to increased terrorist threats. And the head of Homeland Security says there could be more attacks like those in Paris. We are, and we continue to be, and we have been concerned about copycat-like attacks. The travel alert, in effect until February 24th, says current information suggests that militants with Islamic State, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, and other terrorist groups continue to plan attacks in multiple regions. U.S. authorities said the likelihood of terror attacks will continue as members of ISIS return from Syria and Iraq, and other individuals not affiliated with terror groups engage in violence on their own. As seen in Paris, terrorists have targeted places where crowds gather, such as sporting events, theaters, and restaurants. U.S. citizens should exercise vigilance when in public places or using transportation, the alert said. Be aware of immediate surroundings and avoid large crowds or crowded places. Exercise particular caution during the holiday season and at holiday festivals or events. As threats loom both in the U.S. and abroad, President Obama meets with French President Francois Hollande at the White House today. The pair will discuss how to ramp up the fight against ISIS extremists. This meeting comes as a new poll shows that the public does not think that President Obama has a clear strategy for dealing with ISIS. And many critics say the French president has been stronger in dealing with terrorism than President Obama. The meeting also comes as the president is dealing with another serious problem, the question of whether analysts at Central Command, which oversees Pentagon operations in the Middle East, changed assessments of the campaign against ISIS to make it appear as though the U.S. and Western partners were making more progress than they actually were. It's just another problem for the president when it comes to the public's view of how he's handling terrorism. A new CBS poll found that 66 percent do not think he has a clear plan for dealing with ISIS. Now, after terrorism in Paris, terrorism has become the top issue for Americans amid threats of more attacks both abroad and here in America. And the public doesn't believe that President Obama has the answers. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Interesting uh, editorial in the Wall Street Journal today about uh, why Trump may be succeeding as he is, and the polls that were referred to in that editorial shows that the American people just don't trust the government. I mean, the trust in our government is down in the, you know, low double digits, and, you know, it's just unbelievable uh, that we, we don't trust it. We don't think that the government's doing a good job. 
And then we look at the oh, Affordable Care Act. We look at the scandal in the Veterans Administration. We look at scandals with the uh, uh, Secret Service. And, and we see other examples of mismanagement and um, so-called stimulus that didn't stimulate anything. And uh, then we have this constant harping by the president, constant attack mode, always attacking, always attacking his opponents, attacking the other party in Congress, attacking the rich, attacking this group and the other group. And uh, it's small wonder that the American people don't trust the government. And so you've got a candidate coming along that says, I'll promise you the world. Mm -hmm. It'll be wonderful. I'm going to build you a wall. It'll be the most beautiful wall you ever saw. Whatever it is, it's going to be tremendous. It'll be wonderful. Don't worry about a thing. I'm going to make it tremendous. Well, not really. Not really. But if that's who we want, I mean, it's because of the malaise that has settled over this nation in the last eight years. Well, another news. <clears throat> a major international military incident took place today. Turkey shot down a Russian warplane. Putin said it was a stab in the back. John Jessup has that story. That's right, Pat. Russia says it's looking into the circumstances surrounding the downing of that jet near Turkey's border with Syria. Moscow denies that it violated Turkey's airspace and says the warplane was downed by artillery fire. Turkey claims two of its F-16s fired on the Russian jet after it ignored repeated warnings. Russia's defense ministry confirms the pilots were able to parachute, but added Moscow had no further contact with them. Video footage of the incident showed a warplane on fire before crashing onto a hill. Well, many military experts have been saying arming the Kurds is one of the best strategies for taking on, uh, taking on ISIS on the battlefield. But so far, the U.S. hasn't given them the heavy weapons they've been asking for. Chris Mitchell has more from the front lines in Kurdistan. The Kurdish military secured one of its biggest victories recently by retaking the strategic town of Sinjar. Still, the overall challenge in confronting the Islamic State is daunting. The Kurdish military, known as the Peshmerga, hold a more than 600-mile line against ISIS. That includes key towns like Makmur behind me, which controls access to Erbil, the capital of Kurdistan. This is the one fighting force holding its own against ISIS. Look, the PKK affiliate in Syria are the ones that are doing the heavy lifting there, too, from Kobani all the way west. They're the ones that are doing the effective fighting. It isn't anybody else. It isn't the guys that we trained up. Retired U.S. Colonel Richard Nab has worked with the Kurds for nearly 25 years. He says it's in America's interest to support them. Surely they are an ally of the U.S. that we need. Uh, they love America more than I think some Americans do. They're good people, and they're a good friend to have in your court, and they're very important for this region. I would support the Kurds. The Kurds are going to be the, the mainstream. They're going to be the guys that uh, can deal with Iran, they can deal with Syria, and they can do it for us. Despite those positives, the Kurds still haven't received the kind of heavy arms they've requested from the U.S. It has to do with some sort of funky diplomatic legality, you know, which is irrelevant here. Mm -hmm. These people are fighting for their lives. And in a way, they're fighting for our lives in the future. Because if they, they can kill this radical Islam here, so it doesn't migrate to the States, it doesn't become more popular. It's pretty popular now. We talk with Mahmoud, a Kurdish sniper, about the lack of advanced weapons. He responded with a message for Americans. The Americans should realize that we're fighting an Islamic caliphate state. It's not easy. Even though we're suffering from a lack of advanced weapons, we've stood against ISIS. They should realize that with our limited military resources, we can fight them and we will keep fighting them. It's very important for them to know that we also need their help, their military support. He says the Kurds are standing in the gap for the free world. You know, the Kurds proved to the whole world that they're the only force which can stand against ISIS. We're stopping them on the front line so they won't cross the border. Because if they cross the border, the free world will be attacked by ISIS. We're fighting ISIS on behalf of the whole free world. Nab says Americans need to know strength makes a big difference here. I think they need to know that the Middle East needs a strong U.S. presence a strong, uh, forceful presence. 
Part of that is we can exhibit by supporting the Kurds, I think, our friends here. But we are weak here. And when we are weak, the whole thing comes around. Now you see the Russians coming back in Syria. You think things going not better, but worse. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Mark Moore, Kurdistan. Thanks, Chris. And Pat, you've been advocating to arm the Kurds for quite a while. For years. You know, I can't understand it, ladies and gentlemen. These are wonderful people. They have built a prosperous uh, community and small nation uh, in that northern part of Iraq. Somehow at the State Department or at the White House, they're holding on to some kind of a fiction that Iraq is a unified nation. It is no such thing. It is Sunnis, it is Shias, and it is Kurds. There are three groups. It's not one nation any longer. And the, the nation was put together as a stroke of the pen of the great powers back in the 1920s. And it's, not, it's called Mesopotamia. It's nothing but a fiction. And there's no reason why we have to continually pour money into that bunch of thugs in Baghdad who themselves are persecuting their Sunni minority and stirring up racial strife. We have no reason to support them, and we can send military supplies directly to the Kurds. And the thought is, well, we can't have a Kurdistan because it'll make the Turks mad. Who cares? Who cares if the Shias in Baghdad get mad at us? And who cares if the Turks get mad at us? The time we need is to recognize those who are our allies. And there are precious few in that cauldron that's called the Middle East. And the Islamic states are not our allies. But Israel is our strong ally. And the Kurds are our strong ally. And we need to get together and see there's an enclave in Syria, Kurdish. Enclave in Iraq, Kurdish. Enclave in Turkey, Kurdish. Put them together and let's recognize an independent Kurdistan, it would be a boon and blessing in the Middle East. But we need to do it. And we, we just wring our hands and say, will you guys in Washington ever get your act together so we can defeat ISIS? But we won't do it. And ISIS is, you know, I heard something, Terry, that shocked me. <laughs> you know? We launched aircraft against the uh, oil depots of ISIS in Syria. That's their, one of their major right. sources of money. Okay. So we've got our planes flying down. And guess what? What? We, we haul them back. We brought them back. Why? Because there may be civilian truck drivers driving the oil trucks. And if we bomb them, it might get somebody upset. Rules of engagement. True story. Now, that's about as awful as it gets. But that's the way we're dealing with it. And then we said, well, we've had uh, 15 sorties or whatever. I mean, we're just playing with it. So anyhow, it's Thanksgiving. Let's praise the Lord and give him thanks. And who knows, maybe, maybe, maybe the Lord will bless this great nation that we love. John. Pat, here at home, authorities in Indiana have now charged two young men with the murder of Amanda Blackburn, the pregnant wife of that Indianapolis pastor. And court documents show one of them shot her in the back, then leaned over her body, fired another shot in her head, looked at her face, and watched her bleed. The young mother was killed during a home invasion and robbery. The affidavit says 18-year-old Larry Taylor later told witnesses he killed Blackburn. Police have also charged 21-year-old Jalen Watson for using her ATM card to steal cash. Officials say a trio of suspects committed three burglaries that morning in addition to assaulting and killing Blackburn. Police were able to use DNA and cell phone technology to tie the men to the crimes. Well, the Obama administration has released plans for more than 2,200 new federal, new federal regulations. The Daily Caller reports it's just a preview of just how many more regulations President Obama will try to issue before he leaves office in January 2017. The administration is planning on major new regulations for the energy industry, like new rules for coal mines and the environment. The EPA has already put out new limits on smog that have turned out to be some of the most expensive ever proposed by a federal agency. 
Critics say the Obama administration regulations have been weighing down economic and business growth. And Pat, I know that's one of your commentaries as well. It's over and over and over again. It's like a fungus. I mean, it's going to be like, you know, a, a creeping fungus that is just spreading through our nation. And what Obama knows is if he gets those things in place, it'll be almost impossible to get rid of them. And, and that's what he's trying to do as fast as he can. He wants to socialize this nation. He wants to take over health care. He wants to take over uh, the uh, energy uh, administration. He wants to take over labor. He wants to take over commerce. I mean, he wants, he wants the government to be in charge of everything. And the American people are crying out, we want a smaller government. No, we've had too much government. Get, get it off our backs. Well, they're crying out, but right now, <clears throat> there's nothing much they can do about it until they get a new president. And so people are crying out, but folks, you better be careful. You listen, listen carefully to the rhetoric that is being expressed in this election. Be careful. Weigh carefully what people are saying and what their programs are and make these candidates come forth with programs that will satisfy what the nation needs and then hold their feet to the fire after they've promised it. Terry? It'll be a long year, right? <laughs> oh, brother. <laughs> well, up next, Muslims from Belgium committed the Paris attacks and Jews from Belgium aren't the least bit surprised. The tranquil years are definitely over. You can go to a grocery and all of a sudden somebody could shoot you down. You can go to a museum and the same can happen. See why it's no longer safe for Jews in the Jerusalem of the North. That's next. Some of you may remember back to President Roosevelt who set out the four freedoms he said the freedoms that people should enjoy in the world, one of them is freedom from fear. And uh, what if you lived in fear that you could get shot simply by going to the grocery store? Well, that's the reality for the Jews living in Belgium. We've been reporting for years that Belgium is a hotbed of radical Islam. And now the Jews who live in that country worry that they will be the next target. Our Dale Hurd brings us this in-depth report. Jews have lived in Belgium for almost 2,000 years. Antwerp has been called the Jerusalem of the North. Belgium used to be a safe place for Jews. Not so much anymore. Many of the killers in the recent Paris attacks were Belgian Muslim radicals, the kind who are violently anti-Semitic. In a series of interviews conducted before the attack, Belgian Jews told CBN News that life in Belgium was still good, but the possibility of danger was ever present. The idyllic years are over. The tranquil years are definitely over. It can come, you can go to a grocery, and all of a sudden somebody could shoot you down. You can go to a museum, and the same can happen. Professor Julien Klenner was a hidden child during the Holocaust, while half of Belgium's Jews were sent to Nazi death camps. Now he must face it all again. How comes that the Shoah was not able to quiet down people about Jews? Why didn't that disappear into the, the oblivion of history? like so many other ludicrous uh, approaches. Why is it still there? What have I done, done to deserve that? At the heavily protected Jewish Takamoni school in Antwerp, director Jan Maas told us the school's history and how in World War II it was liberated by Allied troops. So these are all American soldiers, I think, here. The US Army, USA, 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 USA. We are very grateful to them. <laughs> and Moss shared how during part of the Nazi occupation of Belgium, the principal at Takamoni was an SS officer. And I know from one of the former students, he told me, he got his Star of David here in school. He got it here in school. Today, the school's students are threatened again by forces in Belgium that want to kill them. Michael Greenberg is the head of Jewish studies at Takamoni. If we think that it's not... Um, 
enough secure to let them to go outside during the day. We keep all the students here during the, 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 the day. Most of them get over the fact that, yes, for most of the activities you need protection, you need security. At Beth Kabad Synagogue in Brussels, Rabbi Shimon Lasker said he personally thinks reports of anti-Semitism are overblown. Yet outside, they removed the sign for the synagogue because it kept getting vandalized. They came in the middle of the prayers, the Jewish security, to announce that uh, when you go home, please be careful, don't walk too many people together, don't try to show that Jews are walking on the street. Could you imagine? That's what we have to think about. How to walk on the street? Today, you have anti-Semitism from the left and the extreme left. Anti-Semitism that uh, is going into a form that's called anti-Zionism. And you have anti-Semitism from the Arab and Muslim communities. Vivian Teitelbaum, a member of the Brussels region parliament, says the government isn't doing enough to stop it. It's being a problem in schools, it's a problem on the streets, it's a problem uh, with the uh, graffitis on the wall, it's a problem of security, it's a problem, it, it, it's a problem in, in many different aspects of our daily lives. In the Flemish town of Mechelen, the Holocaust Museum has been built next door to a former German army barracks, where Jews were deported to concentration camps. Claude Marinover, vice chairman of the museum and vice mayor of Antwerp, says Belgian Jews today should not have to risk being attacked in the street for looking Jewish. There is no reason whatsoever that a Jew, religious or not, should walk down a street from a city, big or small, in Belgium with the fear of being attacked because of that. Unacceptable. Serge Rosen, president of the Jewish Congress in Belgium, is worried about the rise of anti-Semitism, but cautions that it is not like the pre-Nazi period. When uh, people start to compare the situation of the Jews now with what existed uh, uh, before the war, I don't think that's relevant as a, as a comparison. I think um, uh, we are well integrated in the societies. The mainstream societies accept us, respect us. The political authorities support us. But it's a fair question to ask if some Jews are in denial over the danger they face. The same was asked of Jews in Europe during the 1930s, when it was said that the pessimist left for New York. The optimist went to Auschwitz. Even when the trains came for them, some Jews believed they were being taken to a better life and not to certain death. Europe today is not Nazi Germany, but anti-Semitism is worsening. And yet many Jews again choose to hope because they don't want to leave. But with the Muslim migrant surge from the Middle East, even more anti-Semitism is being imported into Europe. Baron Jacques Brochi is a neurosurgeon and Belgian senator. They import the conflict of the Middle East. And due to that, the message is not a message of living together it's not a message of love it's a message of sometimes killing jews for most jews everywhere whether to stay or go comes down to the welfare of their children and this is where i think today the jewish community in brussels <coughs> uh, i'm talking about people who were born in belgium are starting to ask themselves is belgium the place for the future of their children or the future for them to continue living. And for increasing numbers of Jews, the answer to that question is no. Security? Look, look, send your kids to a Jewish school here in Brussels or even in Antwerp. What do you see? Paratroopers? Is that a normal life? After the recent Paris attack, Zaka, the Israeli emergency response team, held drills with Belgian Jews on how to deal with terror attacks and so-called mass casualty events, a clear sign that some fear the worst. Belgium has to start fighting so that its Jewish community can stay here because a democracy that cannot defend its minorities is not a democracy anymore. Dale Heard, CBN News, in Brussels and Antwerp, Belgium. I tell you, it breaks your heart to see things like this emerging. You thought after the Holocaust, never again. When I was in Eastern Europe, I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe the virulent anti-Semitism that existed. 
I mean, I was in Romania, maybe at max 3,000 Jews, you know, in the whole country. And yet there was this terrible anti-Semitism. And uh, the only thing I can think of is it is spawned by the devil himself. It is, it is a spiritual thing that, that uh, it shouldn't be there. But it was fanned, of course, by the Nazis. And it's one of those things that we cannot allow it to stand. And yet it is standing, whether we like it or not. And uh, it's a terrible thing. But you know, Antwerp is the center of the diamond business, probably for the world. There's a big center in London where De Beers has a, uh, their sightings, as they call them. But um, really, there's so many. The Jewish people are, you know, the, the leaders in that diamond business. And I don't know if that's a cause of jealousy, but uh, that is a, an amazing craft they have. And, and Antwerp is the place that you, you buy and sell diamonds. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's been their city for so many years. But uh, thousands of them are leaving. They're getting out ahead, and, and uh, they're going to Israel. But uh, folks, we can't allow this. We need to pray about it. We need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We need to pray for the Jewish people. And uh, along with the Jews, the Christians, because when one goes, the next one will be not too far behind. Terry? Still ahead, a woman in unbearable pain has a little talk with Jesus. I said, take care of my husband. Give him a good wife when I'm gone so he's not alone. Take care of my children. Watch what happens when Jesus answers after this. To listen to our top songs of the week, go to CBN Radio at CBN.com. Does Jesus heal people today? Does he? Well, we're going to tell you about it. Barbara Hernandez was paralyzed, unconscious, and on life support, but she could still feel horrific pain. And when that pain became unbearable, Barbara was ready to die. The morning of February 6, 2008, Barbara San and Hernandez collapsed after taking a shower. I couldn't move. I looked at my legs. I was trying to wake them up, you know, I was hitting them. Nothing, I couldn't even feel that. At the hospital, tests showed Barbara had Guillain-Barre syndrome, or GBS. It's a rare neurological disorder where the immune system attacks the nervous system. Neurologist Ken Ellington explains. You can think of a nerve as sort of a copper wire with rubber insulation around it. And in this disease, the body, it sort of attacks the insulation and strips it off. And so the signal doesn't get through to the muscles very well. And that makes you appear weak. They told Barbara it could also result in paralysis. You think paralyzed, you're not gonna walk anymore. The first thing I was asking is, am I gonna walk again? As with most cases of GBS, doctors expected the symptoms to pass within a few months. Barbara, along with her husband, Carlos, and their family began to pray. I had to communicate with God and just say, you know, help me hear how to approach this, how to take things in stride, because it was going to be a long trip. I could sense it. He was right. Barbara's condition declined rapidly. Within two weeks, she was paralyzed, unconscious, and on life support. She was moved to Seton Medical Center in Austin, Texas. The hospital staff worked around the clock to keep her alive. Carlos stayed at her bedside. The Lord gave me so much strength that I was so focused on what I needed to be doing. Doctors were very concerned. They had seen cases of GBS before, but nothing like this. So she had a very, very severe form of it and that's only been described in the medical literature six or seven times. She had a, a full lung collapse. The other one was partially collapsed. She developed some blood clots too as well. Her blood pressure was so erratic. They would try to level it off. It would bottom out, and then it would just go sky high. 
Meanwhile, Barbara was living her own nightmare. According to Dr. Ellington, she was in a dreamlike state, which means she could feel pain. This was severity, like people were stabbing, you know, like I had stabs, uh, burn, like my skin was on fire. Still, Carlos believed God would answer their prayers. There was just so much against her. It started developing within those few months. We, as family, started praying to God to help us. Four months passed. Barbara says she couldn't bear the pain any longer. I was tired now. I said, if this is the way it is before you die, then Lord, take me. And I had my conversation with the Lord at that time. I said, take care of my husband, give him a good wife when I'm gone so he's not alone. Take care of my children. And as I told him that, and I felt such a peace, such a beautiful, beautiful peace. I heard a voice very clear. It, it was like a, like a song. Like somebody sang it so beautiful and it was a man's voice. And I believe it was the Lord. And he told me, it's not your time. And there was a click in my ears and my hearing went on. My sight, I believe, didn't return till a week or two later. After such a long time, Barbara couldn't wait to talk to her family and the hospital staff. Oh yes, a beautiful, beautiful day, beautiful day. All the nurses that I had came in the room. Everyone was surrounding me. She just got warmed up and took off. And it was Barbara all back again. It was just a great, great gift. We got back. Barbara started the long process of recovery. Considering the severity of her case, doctors weren't sure how well she would do. That led to me trusting the Lord, you know, putting all my faith in Him. I started looking back at the whole memory of it and saying, you know, if you got me through all of that, nothing is impossible with you, Lord. Nothing, nothing is impossible. You'll get me out of this, too. Barbara returned home determined to walk. After go. months of therapy and prayer, Ooh. she did. God's there to hand you the many gifts that He has for you if you ask and rely on Him. He's there. Every morning when I wake up, of course, I'm thankful. I'm thankful to be alive, that I'm here. There isn't a day that I am not thankful to the Lord. I mean, I am truly thankful that I can get a fork in my hand and bring food to my mouth. The little things like that, that I couldn't do, that we take so much for granted. I'm so grateful and so thankful to be alive. Thankful to be alive. What a wonderful lady. Thank God. Here's something that we have. Came in from a place called Wonder Lake, Illinois. His name is Bill. He developed pain in his jaw. He could hardly eat or even drink a cup of coffee. Couldn't sleep. His gums were painful. And uh, one day he was watching this program. And Terry, did you know Bill in Wonder Lake, Illinois? I still don't know Bill. You still don't know Bill. Well, here's what you said. You have a jaw that's out of alignment. You can hardly eat anymore. God is moving that back into place. Bill put his hand up to his face, and within 15 minutes, the swelling started to go down. By the end of the day, the pain and the swelling was completely gone. And he praises God in Wonder Lake, Illinois. Unbelievable. Right. Well, six, for six months, Barbara, who lives in Carlsbad, New Mexico, had trouble with her esophagus, and it affected her digestive system. She'd lost weight until she was barely over 100 pounds, mm. saw many doctors, none of them able to find a solution. One day, watching this program, she heard you say, Pat, you have an esophageal problem, and it has something to do with your digestion. She was surprised that someone would address her specific problem. 
home. She claimed the word was healed, hasn't had any trouble since then. You know, surrounding us, folks, is an invisible army of angelic beings. The power of the Holy Spirit. There's another world that is so much more powerful than the world we can see. We see pain, we see suffering, we see poverty, we see all this stuff. But God lives in a world where everything's possible, where there's nothing impossible. And so he says, look, if, if you'll just join with me and if you'll agree with me, nothing's impossible. So right now, Terry and I are going to join hands together. We're going to believe God for you, and we're going to see miracles. Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for these miracles that we're hearing about. And we confess, Lord, that in you all things are possible. Lord, we think of this world we live in. We, we think of this nation. And this Thanksgiving, we are thankful, Lord. We are thankful for the blessing that you have bestowed on every one of us. Thank you for letting us live in a free land. Thank you, Lord. And as Lord, as we're being assailed on every side by, by evil forces, we pray that you will restrain that which is evil. And Lord, bring healing in the name of Jesus. Terry, what do you have? Um, there's someone you heard in that story, um, the woman talk about her ears popping and, and her hearing turning on. Well, you've been losing hearing and concerned about it. God's restoring it to you today. Put your hands on your ears and just receive what God's doing. Well, you're hurting up around your neck. Uh, I don't know which numbers of your vertebrae, but there's some of them that are deteriorating right as we speak. Place your hand on your neck in the name of Jesus. Power is going through you. In the name of Jesus right now, those vertebrae are being rebuilt, and the pain will leave, and you will have complete mobility. Terry? And there's somebody else. You've had a, a past injury that's created some um, scar tissue in your ankle, and it's very painful. God is totally restoring to you what you had before the injury. You're not going to have any pain, and you're going to walk freely in Jesus' name. Somebody, I believe your name's Michael, you, you're, you're just crying out to God. You, you don't know what to do. You're confused and you're weak and you're asking God to give you an, a sign and give you a blessing. Right now, that blessing is coming in the name of Jesus. Just receive it. Thank you, Lord. Amen. amen. And amen. Wherever you are, please let us hear from you. We love to have your prayer requests and we love to have the answers to prayer. The Lord is speaking to you. So. Telephone number is there. It's not a, doesn't cost you a thing. It's all free. 1-800-759-0700. Terry. Well, still ahead, Christmas is just four and a half weeks away, meaning that the start of Advent season is right around the corner. Each week of Advent, we start with one, then we light two, then we light three, and we light four. Because Christ is coming, it's getting stronger and stronger. One Nun takes us through some of the holiday traditions when we come back. Welcome back to the 700 Club. The family of the Muslim teenager who was arrested and suspended for making a clock that school authorities thought was a bomb has filed a lawsuit against the school and the city. Ahmed Mohammed's attorneys say he was publicly mistreated, so they're suing the city of Irving, Texas for $10 million and the Irving Independent School District for another $5 million. Well, after the incident, Ahmed went on a tour, even meeting President Obama at the White House, and a foundation offered to pay for Ahmed's education in Qatar. So the family moved to that country, and most of the people of Qatar follow the strict Wahhabi version of Islam. Well, more than 200 experts, academics, and community leaders came together in Iowa Monday to discuss everything from the terrorist attacks in Paris to the Syrian refugee crisis to America's rule as a world leader. Iowa Republican Senator Joni Ernst had some advice for the presidential candidates on how to deal with multiple crises at once. Leadership is different than being someone in authority. You can carry the title president, but that doesn't necessarily make you a leader. Right now we have a void because we need a leader that will step forward and will say, uh, Arab nations, allies, we need to come together and work together. 
and our David Brody sitting right next to the uh, representative. Well, the event was sponsored by the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition. And you can always find more about that story and get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Well, as you know, next week we mark Give Back Tuesday, and we're so excited about it that we're going to be celebrating it a little bit early. From now through next Tuesday, December 1st, CBN Partners will match your gift dollar for dollar. So any donation, any gift that you give will go twice as far. Isn't that a great deal? More people then will receive food, clean water, medical help, and you can be the answer to someone's prayers. So will you pick up the phone and call our number? Is toll free. It's 1 800 7590 Or you can log on to CBN.com and give back because so many people need your help. And right now, there's a great opportunity for you to make twice as much of a difference, have twice as much impact by giving from now through next Tuesday. Well, many people get ready for Christmas by setting up a tree and decking it out with lights. And there are some who get ready by setting up a wreath and lighting a purple candle. That's how Christians around the world mark the season of Advent. And we spoke with a nun who told us about the meaning behind some of these Advent traditions. It's fall in Summit, New Jersey. Here at the Monastery of Our Lady of the Rosary, Sister Catherine and the Dominican nuns are busy making candles for the upcoming Advent season. The Advent candles are part of the Advent wreath. It's a, it's a very old tradition coming from Germany. Advent was first observed in the late 6th century. It comes from the Latin word Adventus, which means coming. Primarily a season of preparation and a season of reflection on the coming of the Lord. The season begins the fourth Sunday before Christmas and ends on Christmas Eve. There are four candles in the Advent wreath, one for each Sunday. The candles signify the light of Christ coming. And so each week of Advent, we start with one, then we light two, then we light three, and we light four, because Christ is coming, it's getting stronger and stronger. There's a significance in the color of the candles. Uh, there's three purple ones and one rose. The purple signify the season as sort of penitence, but it's also a joyful season because Christ is coming. And that's why there's that rose candle, to remind us that we're not supposed to get so caught up in our penitence, that we are also supposed to be joyful because Christ is coming. The Dominican nuns started making and selling the candles to help pay for their basic necessities. The multi-step process takes hours to complete, but they insist on doing it the old-fashioned way and using only the best materials. One of the things that we decided when we were making our Advent candles is that we would make them 100% beeswax. The purity of this, this wax extracted from the bees is a symbol of, of Christ's pure love. Sister Catherine hopes people understand that there's much more to Advent than candles and traditions. Observing the season of Advent and using things like the Advent wreath and Advent candles um, can help us be more mindful of why we're here, why God created us, what we're meant for. We're celebrating Christ and our focus is on Him and His coming. And then we would receive what we've been waiting for and longing for, there's so much, the joy is so much more richer. You know, one of the things I love about the celebration of Advent is it keeps us focused on what really matters about this season, which is pretty challenging these days, isn't it? I mean, people are decorating, sales are already on, it's all about acquiring more stuff. And though it's lovely to buy for other people, to stay focused on the arrival of the Christ child is really what the Christmas season is supposed to be mm -hmm. about. So what a great way to help your family do that. Tomorrow, Pat's daughter-in-law is going to show you more ways that you can mark the Advent season for you, for your family. So make sure to watch or you can set your DV DVRs to get that. I know you'll want to add it to your Christmas holiday. Well, coming up, your email questions. Devin says, when I pray, I feel like God doesn't hear me. Did I do something wrong? Stay tuned. Another round of Bring It On when we come back.
Well, we have some time to bring it on with your email questions. So, Pat, this first one comes from Devin, who says, when I cry out to God, I feel like he doesn't hear me. God told me my sister and cousin were going to get married, and they did. But when I ask about my future, I get silenced. Did I do something wrong? Are my problems too small? Uh, look, God isn't some holy fortune teller, Swami sitting up in heaven with a big crystal ball to give you the answers to everything that's coming up in life. It just doesn't work that way. I mean, there are times that you have what's called a word of wisdom, and, and the Lord will give you an insight into something. But it's something dealing with what you're doing or to give you guidance and strength as to where you're supposed to be, but just not um, idle question, well, what's going to happen to my son-in-law, you know? I mean. Yes. The Lord may not want to tell you. So I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about it. All right. This is Kim who says, My son and his wife have been married for several years. When she gets mad at him, she leaves and hooks up with another man and moves in with him until she gets mad at him and goes back to my son. This has been going on for many years. My concern is for my young granddaughter who sees this going on. How do I deal with this? My son just won't get a divorce and move on. You know, grandpa, grandfather, whatever you are, I'm a great grandfather, you can't live your kid's life. Well, that's the truth. They're adults. That woman, you know, I love the thing that Charles Wesley said about that terrible woman he was married to. She said, I didn't send her away and I didn't go get her. And I mean, that was. <laughs> <laughs> that was the end of it. Arrivederci. Arrivederci. Okay. But in this case, that woman is nuts. And for your son to put up with that mess over the years is just absurd. He has every ground in the world legally and morally and spiritually to divorce that woman and, and get her out of his life. But if he's such a milk toast that he likes to get stepped on and walked on, he's going to have it. And unfortunately, he has a child, and the child's got to endure that stuff. Yeah. I don't think you've got grounds to ask for legal custody of the child, take the child away from him. Uh, I, I, you could probably say they're unfit parents, but I don't think you want to do that. And so. All I can say is pray and ask the Lord to intervene and bring something to pass. But it's uh, it's up to your son. Your son could have, should have moved on that years ago. Okay, this is Ruth Pat who says, Pat, I've worked in healthcare a few years now, and although I love most of my patients, I find myself becoming increasingly bitter and angry with my job. Sadly, it's not anything like what we were taught in, taught in school. In fact, it's next to impossible to do all we're required to in the job. I know my attitude isn't pleasing to God, and I want to please Him on my job by doing my best, but I don't see how I can in this job. I want to just jump ship and move on. What advice would you give to someone facing serious burnout. Um, I would think you, you know, the last thing a patient who's sick needs is some health care provider who is all out of sorts and mean and unhappy. And run out of steam. And run out of steam because those people have got to be loving and caring and giving, I mean, even though it hurts. So if you're burned out, I really suggest you change jobs. I mean, take a little time off uh, to regroup. Possibly you're working in a situation. You know, I, I've seen these these nurses. Uh, you know, I say I'm lying there. You, uh, hey, I'm the patient, and she's. Well, I'm sorry, I've got to fill up my computer, and she's banging away on a computer. Uh, you know, I, well, I've got to enter all this data. Well, I mean, it's nice to have the data, but how about the patient? I think a lot of hospitals are losing contact with that you know, personal relationship because of the demands of this extraordinary amount of, of data that they, they're required to get. But uh, you, you might find a less demanding job, but I sure would move on because you're not helping yourself and you're not helping your patients. Okay, this is Cheech who says, why is my morality not enough to make me a good human? Why would I need God to tell me what I need to believe in? God believes humans are that dumb? It's not dumb, you're wicked, you're evil. That's, that's what the problem is. Uh, you go apart from the womb speaking lies. The heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who could know it? And if all we are left is our own devices, we will go downhill constantly. It's, it's an, unless there's an exterior source to lift us up, we're going to go continually down. That's what's happening. You take God out of a society. The Bible says, without 
a vision of God, and it's not of God, but I'm adding it, without a vision of God, the people run amok. You have to have a vision of God. Otherwise, we are deceitfully wicked, and there's something about our nature that is sinful. Look at the first couple of kids on earth. They got one of them was jealous of the other when he killed him. I mean, right off the bat, you have a murder. Um, and, you know, you have adultery, you have evil, you have all this stuff. Why do you need God? Something has got to come from an external source and changes. And when we take God out of society, the society is going to run downhill. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for being with us. Terry, you are a jewel. We're so, thank you for being here. Oh, it's a treat to be here with you well, every day. We start the for, day together. It's a treat for all of us. <laughs> well, we leave you with today's Power Minute from Psalms. The Lord has been mindful to us. He will bless us. He will bless those who fear the Lord, small and great. And by the way, tomorrow, we're going to celebrate Thanksgiving at the place that hosted the very first Thanksgiving, Plymouth Rock, on Wednesday's 700 Club. So for Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.